We are in Westwood, Massachusetts with Carl Mueller, a longtime MIT trustee um, at his apartment. Good morning. Thank you Good morning. for talking to us. In 1990, you became the fourth person in MIT's history to be named an honorary lecturer along with Winston Churchill and Cecil Green, Eugene McDermott. You had served by then for more than 20 years on the MIT Corporation's Executive Committee, its Investment Committee, its Development Committee, and you were an active participant in virtually every significant policy decision MIT made during those years, mostly behind the scenes. You also served on the search committees for three MIT presidents and one chairman, and led three of those committees. In his memoir, James Killian, MIT's former president and chairman, and a science advisor to President Eisenhower, talked of his special relationship with you, of your devotion to MIT, and he also spoke about your broad concept of the role of a trustee. What exactly was your role of the trustee? What, how did you approach it? With affection. <laughs> I don't know that I have any specific thing in mind. MIT was always where I wanted to go to school, and I was fortunate enough to get there. And I ran into all sorts of interesting people. But in our society at this time, and similarly 30, 40 years ago when it began, I thought MIT made a difference in our society. And it was a pleasure and an honor to be able to participate in the good works of that great institution. I could talk for another half an hour, but that's, <laughs> that's about it. We'll come back to that. How did you choose to attend at MIT? You well, I think I mentioned it to you. In 1932, when I was 12 years old, my father decided that he and I should go to Nova Scotia and uh, see if we could catch a ride with a fishing boat looking for tuna fish and also mackerel, and we did. We camped off the coastline up there and saw both, and it was quite a trip. But en route, we went through Boston, and my dad was an engineer, and I worshipped my dad, and I thought I would like to be an engineer, and... Uh, the things I did best at school tended to circle around mathematics, and he encouraged me. And so I early on announced that I was going to be an engineer. And we had a real long conversation driving past MIT on Memorial Drive. Father <laughs> said, that's the best engineering school in the world. If you want to be an engineer, that's the place to go. End of discussion. And uh, some years later, when it came time to apply, that's the only place I applied. And uh, I never had a moment's regret. It even looked like I thought a place like that ought to look. <laughs> and uh, I, I can't explain it any further than that. What was your experience there like, in the classroom and outside? Would you spend? 100 hours a week studying? Or? Well, I had a little trouble the first term getting started. I came from a high school that was a nice high school, but it wasn't a leader in academics, and I had to self-teach myself in some things. For instance, trigonometric identities I'd never heard of, and when they start differentiating them in calculus, <laughs> I had to first go teach myself the trigonometric identities, and so it, it was a bit of a scramble. But that was probably good fortune. Uh, what had been easy for me was not so easy, and it required a bit of organization. But I had met lots of fine men, young men, 
I had stumbled, like a lot of things in my life, into the business of rowing at a freshman camp weekend. And to this day, one of my closest friends in this life is Joe Cavan. And we met each other in a lap streak, which is a sort of a working shell, at a YMCA camp, I believe it was, somewhere in New Hampshire, where MIT took anybody in the freshman class for a weekend if they wanted to go before school started. Hmm. And I would guess 90% of the entering freshmen were at that camp that weekend. And looking around for what I might do, <clears throat> I found that lap streak, as it was called. <laughs> and I got in the boat. And uh, two of my best friends in this life, Joe and Bill Fulberth, were there. And uh, if I may be sentimental, Bill's gone now. But we've made a pact that for the first million years of eternity, we're going to row up and down the Charles River from the <laughs> Cottage Farm Bridge up to Watertown. <laughs> and Bill's up there checking out the available equipment. But, again, good luck. Besides meeting your friends in the boat, did rowing... Uh teach you anything or uh, I mean do you, do you view that as a kind of lesson or was it the way to let it off steam? I would say in hindsight that getting regular exercise you know in my old age I'm a believer in WC fields if you feel the urge to exercise lie down be quiet <laughs> it'll go away <laughs> If you go through an intensive place like MIT, some regular exercise is, is desirable and I suspect beneficial. I did not roll because of that, but it turned out to be that. What was more attractive to me were, were the people I encountered. Yeah. And you also had joined a fraternity while you were? Theta Chi Fraternity on Beacon Street. MIT for me is... Uh, largely personal friendships. And not just the students, but some of the teachers, Asher Shapiro, for his, was my thesis tutor with my classmate, Ray O'Connell. Wonderful man, brilliant man. And uh, I was not quite 21 when I graduated, so I didn't get an ROTC commission. And while well, I had decided to the war was coming and I better exercise that commission and it took me all summer to change the certificate of capacity, which is what I got instead of the commission, into a commission. And I worked with Joseph Keenan, Keenan and Key steam tables over at MIT and that was a wonderful experience. But there really wasn't a heck of a lot of planning to all this. I, I listened to my children and grandchildren talk about their careers from start to finish. <laughs> Mine was the uh, next opportunity that jumps up. I mean, I took a huge zigzag from thermodynamics to banking just by accident. And... Uh, <laughs> I always found it adventurous. And what was the accident? How, how did you enter? Well, I was waiting to be mustered out at Mitchell Field and they were so crowded with people that you were, you were given X dollars a day, about five dollars a day to go live in a hotel and feed yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and then you were to call the duty officer every day and had your number come up yet and I was doing that and I went to lunch downtown I, I intended to meet somebody downtown for lunch and he couldn't come so I went into Schraff's basement and sat down at a table and a nice man came in and the lady asked if I would mind company and turned out he was a young officer at the Bankers Trust Company and he knew that the bank had hired a Douglas Aircraft Company vice president of sales to counsel the bank in the burst of aviation in the post-war era, and he had brought with him a, an airline economist type 
but he wanted somebody with a technical background. <laughs> and here sitting across the table from this guy is a character from MIT in the major's uniform, and he invited me to lunch at the bank the next day. And I went up there, and a fellow I had known in the Air Force uh, as a captain who was a, sort of the housekeeper for a job I got assigned to after the war with a bunch of Harvard Business School professors and an Air Force officer and a fellow from the Bureau of Aeronautics named Lawrence Rockefeller. We did case studies on airplane engine and airplane airframes procurements and building construction. And somebody had a good idea, I really thought, as if we had another war call up, we at least make new mistakes, not the <laughs> old ones. <clears throat> and I worked with this bunch. And that was a great business, running around the country with a bunch of Harvard Business School professors. <clears throat> and the guy who was the captain who was running this, Turned out he was an older man. I never understood why he was a captain either. He was very intelligent, and he worked in General Arnold's office. And in any event, it turned out he was a vice president of the Bankers Trust Company. <laughs> and he saw me walk in. He jumped out of his chair and he came over. He said, "We got to hire you." That's his opening statement. Now that's being lucky. <laughs> and I thought about it. And having never spent a millisecond considering banking, it was intriguing. Uh, a week or two later, I accepted to go to work there. Did you f find that you were needing to explain to your father or your oh, yeah. professors how it was that you were Well, I told my abandoned? father and Joe Keenan yeah. I was going to go to work for the bank. You might have thought I was going to work in a bordello or something. <laughs> I mean, that was just awful. <laughs> but you didn't feel awful. I, mean, I just it felt thought it good. was an adventure. Right. And it was. It has been. And uh, I, I, I have to add, I love to add these footnotes. <clears throat> Keenan had a great sense of humor. And it turned out when we started going to Nantucket with our big family some years later, Joe and his family still had a place up there. And we picked up our friendship again. In fact, Joe and Sue played tennis together often. <clears throat> I'm not a tennis player, but in any event, <clears throat> Joe's interest in thermodynamics, world class, was steam, the thermodynamics of steam. And he and a fellow named Keyes, head of chemistry department at MIT, produced what is known as Keenan and Keyes steam tables. Now, this is a very special subject. There are very limited people who have any idea what this is, but you can quite accurately say that every steam turbine on this earth since 1936 or 8 was designed to Keenan and Key's steam tables. And I might point out that every atomic energy plant has a steam turbine in it. You take the heat from the uranium, run the boiler, the boiler produces steam, the steam drives a turbine, the turbine drives a generator, and that's how you get electricity. They're all designed to this day, Keenan and Key steam tables. Now, nobody but nuts like me would find that remarkable, but in the whole of human life, you just Everybody depends on power, and all of it touches Keenan Keys on the way to becoming electric energy. But this long-winded piece, Joe used to like to say, but for him, steam thermodynamics was the study of water gone crazy with the heat. <laughs> and, and I, I used to like to tell my banking friends, some general understanding of things gone crazy with the heat as broad human utility. <laughs> <laughs> and it does. Did, did, did you ever feel like 
the banking community understood you or was talked your language the same way that the MIT community did? I, I, I sometimes well, there were some very, very bright people around, you know, uh, in every one of those great banking successes, there are people of high IQs, uh, and they're famous for it. But when in 1946, uh, does the name Tom Creamer ring any bell? Tom Creamer, who who was uh, uh, assistant to Killian, I guess, or Compton. I guess he was Dr. Compton's leg man or something. <clears throat> he was the only other one I could find. He had gone to work for what was then the National City Bank. And he and I used to see each other with some frequency. I, he'd lived next door to me on Beacon Street. And we spent a little time trying to find one or two others downtown. We did find one. He was the chairman of the National City Bank, <laughs> Rentschler. And we made a typical MIT calculation. If you took the average salary of MIT men on Wall Street, which meant dividing Mr. Rentschler's salary by three, you came to a number that was far bigger than any other <laughs> school. <laughs> Let but there are lots of MIT boys down there now. Right. They yeah. discovered the application of mathematics and trading and et cetera. When you graduated in 1941 from MIT, how did you feel about it, about the Institute, and did you expect to stay engaged with it? Did you? Uh, the Institute very kindly offered me help in getting a doctorate, <clears throat> and this was Keenan. And I wrestled with the question of war and peace, and I concluded rather quickly that there was a war coming, and I just as soon not wait for the great white father to pull a chain and me and nine million other people just, and Professor Hunsaker, who was then head of course two, was also head of course 16, aeronautical engineering. And he told me there was a very interesting thermodynamic project underway at the General Electric plant in Lynn, Massachusetts, very secret. And he shouldn't say anything more about that. But if I trusted him, he would write me a few letters, which he did. And of all things, when I got my commission in the Air Force, I shortly got ordered to, to the Lynn. There was another Air Force officer there, Lynn Plant of the General Electric Company, West Lynn. And I mean, the River Works. There was also a West Lynn plant, but this was the River Works where they were building turbo superchargers, which aspirated aircraft engines into high altitude. <clears throat> but more importantly, it was the first place to attempt building an aviation jet propelled engine, which is a, a gas turbine, not unlike a turbo supercharger, but rather bigger and different in design. And that was had been undertaken with great secrecy there. And indeed, at one or two points, the British Air Marshal, Whittle, would come stay in the Edison Hotel in Lynn. And you know, for a 21-year-old to be circling around with a British Air Marshal and a secret project and Mr. Nelson Darling, the works manager, to keep the secrecy here, they had a, this is before computers, they had just begun to have IBM card sorters, but the accounting department in that plant with 40,000 people working in it was huge. Right. You know, you put the, in the journal and the journals into the ledgers. and yeah. So he just plunked down <laughs> a couple okay. dozen of the engineers working in secrecy in the middle of the accounting department. I don't know how long they stayed there. And I didn't have anything to do with the 
high tech of that, but this other officer and I would produce a letter back to Wright Field, which was the headquarters during the war of engineering and procurement in the Air Force, uh, what was going on with this high secrecy thing. Well, but, that was pretty exciting for, for a 20, yeah. 21 year old. But after the war, you became involved with MIT again as a volunteer? Well, somebody recruited me into being a class, what do you call it, we interview, interview students. Ah, the educational Education counselor. counselor. I did that, and then somehow or other I became a class agent, and I did that for 25 years. I was hustling money from my classmates. And I think I gonged my friend Gavin, and I decided <laughs> I'd had enough of that. But he was pretty involved, too, so the two of he, you kind of I, fed he, each other? He was or? late coming to MIT. I, ah. In fact, I like to think I had a hand in it. I was, I, I was always astonished I hadn't seen him up there. And I, so I talked to that. We have a nominating committee. Of the Alumni Association? Well, no, this is of the... Corporation. The corporation. There's a nominating uh -huh. committee of the corporation, and it's usually presided over by the chairman or the it's the chairman, isn't it? And and I forget who it was. I said, "Why in the name of heavens aren't you thinking about Joe Cavan? Right. This is one of the great engineers of the century. He is. Who helped lead Grumman? Yes. Yeah, but even beyond that. He's the most modest guy you ever heard of, but he's got the Distinguished Service Cross from NASA. And you know what he got it for? When Apollo, Apollo 13 was had an explosion in oxygen bottles and it, it completely destroyed the propulsion equipment in the main vehicle, hauling this whole thing up to the moon. Mm -hmm. They had no way to get these guys back. And Gavin showed up in Houston with four or five of his engineers, and they reprogrammed the lunar lander to bring that whole schmear back to the, to the Earth, reprogrammed it while this thing was going around the moon. Wow. And it worked. So you got him and And when, when it all worked, six months later, he was president of the company. Uh. I just, and why? The, Name of heaven, so we have him on the board. Yeah. And bingo, he got on. So you were named to the MIT Corporation in 1969. Um, how did that come about, do you? Well, I have no way of knowing, but I think <laughs> I've mentioned to you, my guess is <clears throat> I had, again, by accident and so forth, I wound up a director of Cabot Corporation. And when I showed up, for my first meeting, there's James Ryan Killian sitting there. <laughs> and he barely remembered me. Uh, and you had first met him? I had first met him when he was uh, publisher of the Technology Review, 1939 maybe, maybe 40, but more likely 39. And We had a crummy old shell, and we'd had a pretty good year, and some of us were ambitious to get a what was called a pocock, which is an absolutely elegant uh, rowing boat, then manufactured in the Seattle area. And I have embedded in my mind a number, and I'm not sure it's correct, but <clears throat> it sounds cuckoo, but it's what I remember. A new one was going to cost twelve hundred and fifty dollars. Now, in 1939, that was a lot of money. A little more than that is what it cost my father to send me to MIT. So I would guess today fifty thousand dollars for a right room, board, tuition, all well, of it. Well, just taking that as a right scale up. And Gavin and Fulberth and I don't know, maybe somebody else and I went to the athletic association. They did not have $1,250 for a rolling boat, even though we'd beaten a few people for the first time in years. It was tough luck. We don't have it. And then somebody said, you should go talk to that fellow Killian that uh, is the publisher of the Technology Review. And 
my question right away, why should I talk to him? I looked him up. He wasn't even a PhD. <laughs> he never was. Right. Uh, but somebody, and I can't remember it, described Jim Killian to me. And I wouldn't change a word of it. And it's real simple. He knows how to get things done. And he sure as hell did. I went to see him. <laughs> he rummaged around in his head and he took out an alumni something or other. And he said, well, there, you might try getting hold of Horace McCurdy or H.W. McCurdy in Seattle. He's a very successful contractor. He built a floating bridge across Lake Washington. Incidentally, I have a daughter, believe it or not, has a beautiful home on Lake Washington, <laughs> half a mile down from McCurdy's Bridge, which is still there. <laughs> but McCurdy wrote on the crew here. And McCurdy's got a little money. And why don't you take a hand and you want me to look at what you've written, and I'll look at it. So we produced the letter and he doctored it up a little bit. But it was our letter and we sent it out. And back and forth letters started. And so help me God, I was higher than a kite when I got a letter from Mr. McCurdy with a thousand dollar check in it. Now that looked like Rockefeller's money to me. So back we go to Killian. What about the next two fifty we need? Well, he went into the same abacadabra, very low key, unexcited slightly southern accent, and there was a fellow named, uh, you know, I remember these things. These are big things in my life. J.C. Molinar was, uh, by whatever fancy title, he was the chief engineer of Hamilton Standard Propeller. So we cook up another letter, and it goes down to Molinar at Hamilton Standard <laughs> Propeller. <laughs> and, I don't know, he was close enough that we invited him to come up on a Friday night. We put him up in a local hotel, two and a half dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Take him out with a crew. He could ride in the coach's line. And he was a crew man, too. These are all, McCurdy was a MIT crew man, too. Anyhow, Mo and I went home, and a few days later we got a check for 250 or maybe it was $300, at which point the Athletic Association decided they could pay the freight, which might have been $100 to get the darn boat. Now, one other thing happened that I have no idea how it happened, but I'm always suspicious of J.R. Killian. By, by that time, we'd gotten his attention, you know. At least, A, we did what he told us to do, we must have done it reasonably well because it worked. And that's the way you get Jim's attention, too. He has no time for people that don't produce. And uh, the next thing I knew, they engaged a fellow by the name of Robert Mock, M-O-C-H, as crew coach. Now, Mock was sort of off the wall to me. He had been the coxswain of the 1936 University of Washington Olympic gold medal crew. <laughs> he was also a summa at University of Washington, and he was at Harvard Law School first year. And I remember somebody asked him one day, how in the heck can you go to Harvard Law School and coach the MIT crew? He said, if these guys can go to MIT and roll, I can go to Harvard Law School and, <laughs> and coach the crew. And he did. And I think he was law review, too. And he was a very successful attorney in Seattle over the years, and I used to see him now and then. He died a year or two ago. He Wait. was maybe six or seven years older than we were. So with your new boat and your new coach? Yeah, we actually uh, finished ahead of several people. And for MIT, that was, that was pretty heady stuff. We all got straight T's. And, <laughs> but the idea of getting to the end of the course and seeing Princeton or Navy or somebody else behind <laughs> us, <laughs> Jesus. But 
but you didn't the, see the figure circling around in the back of all this. Years and then you all know, of I'm, sudden, I, I would bet my, but I don't know who else would have done that. You walked into the uh, Cabot boardroom and there, there he is. He is. Well, I knew who he was. I used to see him casually around every once in a while. He'd get all the, the. Uh, I can never remember the the uh, the interviewers, uh, the educational uh, counselors. Yeah, and we'd get a pep talk, and he was often the pep talker. Right. But uh, by the time you saw him again at Cabot, he was chairman of MIT. Yes, gone from being publisher of Tech Review to chairman. Yeah, and he must have got an earful out of the Cabots because <clears throat> by then I was at Low Roads and Company Investment Bankers. And I think I told you on the phone, I got introduced to the Cabots, Tom Cabot, <laughs> by my investment banking friends. And they and Cabot built a butadiene and aviation alkalate plant together for which I had arranged the financing because this engineer friend of mine, who turned out to have gotten his doctorate the same day I We'd known each other and done business together for several years. And I one day mentioned that the then president of Standard Oil of Indiana had spoken at my commencement. Pervin said, well, he spoke at mine, too. <laughs> well, it turned out to be the same commencement. <laughs> <laughs> he, he got his SCD and I got my BS. And uh, he had a, uh, a fellow chemical engineer, that's what he got his doctorate in, Andy Stokes, who by then had become vice president of research at Cabot. And when Pervin wanted to find somebody to build this butadiene and aviation alkalate plant, he went to Stokes. Anyhow, we built it. And when it worked, <laughs> the Cabot people put me on their board. And so you suddenly were pulled onto the corporation, but not only that. It was a year or two later, but I always, yeah, I, I always suspected. Killian began to. I was n noticeable. I think it's fair to say I had some considerable effect on a Cabot company. I was a director there for right. thirty years. Wonderful family. I always. I like to say that as a 30-some-year-old banker coming up to Boston, and I was taken into the hearts of two great Boston institutions, MIT and the Cabot family. Right. And uh, that's... But once you went on the MIT Corporation, you got pulled into the high levels of their operations well, very life, quickly. Uh, you, you were on the executive skilling. committee. I, I, Within a year, you got put on a the search committee. Well, that was the, the search co chairman of the well, first search committee, for which was for Wiesner, was uh, Jim Fisk, and he sat down at the end of the executive committee table, and he and I got on like thieves. I never met anybody like Jim Fisk. He was then chairman of the Bell Labs, and that impressed me. And the Bell Labs had their greatest run for the 17 years he ran the place. He was, a, and he was an MIT graduate, doctorate in aeronautical engineering. The whole thing, what the hell that had to do with the <laughs> phone company, I never really understood. But we just hit it off. And when they decided to form a search committee, he had run the search for Howard Johnson. So. They asked him to do what turned out to be the, next the Wiesner search. Right. And he very kindly said he would do that, but he would like to ask that I join him. And I think, and I'd like to check it out sometime, when I did the, the Gray search, Fisk was still alive, and I think he was on the committee with me yeah. then. As you think back, so this was the the late 60s, MIT and, and American society had were in the midst of a period of 
tumult, chaos, Vietnam War. Um, Howard had sort of held the fort, Howard Johnson. What, what, was, what, what did you and the committee think MIT needed at that point in the way of a president? What, uh, well, what were you looking for? The issues as I remember them are pretty simple. There was probably a majority in the faculty, particularly, who favored Wiesner and would feel pretty badly and even angry if we didn't appoint him. He had been provost under Jerry Wiesner. Uh, under Howard. Paul Gr uh, under Howard, right. And on the other hand, there was a smaller group, but not a small group, a smaller but not small, who would be much irritated if he was appointed, nothing related to his intellectual capacity, but he, Jerry liked to talk about things, and he was all worked up about Vietnam, and he talked about it. I think he had, wasn't he science advisor to Kennedy? He was, yeah. And I think he told me one time he couldn't stand Johnson after about six months or six <laughs> weeks or something. And you know, Jerry, boom, that's that, that's that. And he came, you know, all the old lions come back to the zoo and he came back to Cambridge. Uh, <clears throat> but there was quite a schism. And it, it really, what we were looking for, we had, but not without a very strong feeling minority, and that was that turned out to be the problem. We looked around quite quite a bit, um, and I my memory is we, and I can't remember his name. We got quite interested in a fellow who was then head of the National Bureau of Standards. <clears throat> it had changed its name, but I it was mm -hmm. the Bureau of Standards, and he was a bright, attractive fellow, but he wasn't Jerry. You know, Jerry could be a pain in the neck and this and that, but Jerry, I mean, some of the great decisions around MIT, we didn't build a medical school because he didn't think that was our cup of tea. Molecular biology was our cup of tea. Boy, he hit that one right on before anybody else realized it. Uh, he picked high quality people. He, uh, you know, he had all the great gifts and he brought a few idiosyncrasies with him. And one of them was talking about public political policy and uh, this was a very divisive thing and it, in, the, in that search too we had one other problem because <clears throat> the faculty advisory committee were a little more inclined to put up with idiosyncrasies but Fisk handled that and he said if we ever try to get him to take this job, we'll just tell him he's got to talk less about it because when he's president, nobody can tell when it stops being Jerry Wiesner individual and he's, he's got every right to be an individual in his political views. But he has no right to get that confused with what the president of MIT thinks. Right. So there was all this flying around. I will jump to what we discussed and, and we were at it for quite a while maybe a year and it was getting rather discouraging I would say too that the outside world favored Wiesner Fisk sent I I was going to California on a business trip and I asked him you got anybody in California I should look up and he <laughs> said yeah he says there, there's a I gotta think of his name Panofsky. There's a guy by the name of Panofsky, a physicist, world-class nuclear physicist, who is the director of the Stanford Linear Accelerator. And you ought to go call on him and just call up his office. He's a good friend of mine. And tell him I would appreciate it if he would talk to you. And then Jim also told me, I said, who, what about him? He said, well, It'll be an interesting evening for you. He said, uh, 
Panofsky, if he were any shorter than he is, would be a dwarf. And indeed, when he sat in his chair, his feet did not touch the floor. He, he didn't look like a midget, but he was borderline. And he was one of twins. And he and his brother were the sons of a fellow named Erwin Panofsky, who was a world-class art historian at Princeton University. He had these two sons who also went to Princeton as undergraduates and had the all-time academic record at Princeton. Wow. Only the other Panofsky, not the one I was seeing, was known as Panofsky the Bright, and the guy I was seeing was known as Panofsky the Dull. He was one basis point behind his brother. <laughs> and anyhow, with this for I went to see him. And when I first saw him, I, you know, I just couldn't imagine a person like that. Just, I, I'm sorry, but he doesn't look like the president of MIT. But then the man starts talking. And you are transported. He had vast command of his subject. He had humor. He was absolutely charming. And he shut me off before I opened my mouth. He said, I'm delighted to see you, and I'd like to show you my baby, the linear accelerator. But you got the man right in your hand, and you will make a terrible, mis terrible mistake if you don't take him. That's what we would hear from gifted people on the outside. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't just get over that. But what do you do about these other folks on the faculty who, and Joe Keenan was one of them, and I think Asher Shapiro too, who were dismayed by his often expressed political views. And it's all right for Fisk to say, oh, we'll tell him he's gotta keep quiet. But anyhow, we were in that point and quite literally, the phone rang one night, and it was Mr. Killian on the phone. <laughs> and said, Carl, this has been going on a long time. <laughs> we, we, we gotta get on with this or we're gonna have problems. Got any ideas? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he said, well, why don't you put it on the table? And I said, well, I, I haven't thought it through, but to the degree I've thought about it, I thought it had merit. And it starts with the fact that uh, Jerry appointed Paul as Dean of Engineering as a very young Dean of Engineering six or nine months before. And one or two things I've heard since then indicated to me that Paul and Jerry, being rather different animals, both on the other hand electrical engineers, both beautifully spoken, both command great respect, but best of all, for what we were trying to deal, they seemed to be particularly good friends. But I didn't have the evidence to prove that. I just, that was a gut feeling, and I'd seen one or two of it. And Killian said, you don't have to talk to anybody beyond me. That's absolutely the case. And I, over the years, have visited with them. The two of them were devoted to each other. I, I, I really never understood how it got that way. but. It wasn't quite father and son, but one was quite a bit older than the other, and they got along like this. So what had occurred to me, when you find intransigence, sometimes it helps if you shoot off a firecracker or you know upset everybody's intellectual tea cart. And I, I said something about it. I don't remember what I said to Jim, but that starts with that. And if you tell me they're good friends, that makes me a little more nervy. But supposing we appoint two people instead of one. And Jim said, would you appoint him as provost? And I said, I shouldn't be the judge of that, but I didn't think so. I think that would demean Jerry. It would irritate the faculty. But everybody knows Paul. And God knows there's enough going on in the president's office that he can keep three good men busy. <laughs> and, but this will, it'll reshuffle the deck. I, I, and, he, and Jim said, Carl, that's a 
That's a fair idea. What do we do now? I said, well, I, I, I'm going to stop talking. I think you ought to hang up with me, and you ought to call my chairman and talk to him. I have not talked to him about this, and we are close friends, and I don't want to get on the wrong side of Jim Fisk. And so you please call Fisk. And he said, I will do that right away. <laughs> I've really never talked much about this before, but that happened, and 20 minutes later, Fisk and Killian were on the phone, and Fisk had no belly button. He didn't give a damn who invented anything. That's why he did so well running to Bell Labs. He said, that's a great idea. And we talked about it for half an hour. And somebody said something about, uh, I've forgotten, what, what, what do we call Paul? It, was a, it sounded like faculty and not administration. Uh, Chancellor? Chancellor. 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 Yeah. We call it, we didn't want to, he shouldn't have, he, should, he really, it would have irritated Jerry. I don't think he would have accepted it. Jerry had the right to pick his own provost. provost. But who the hell knew what a chancellor did? It did turn out, I did not know it at the time. And Paul told me afterwards that uh, um, preceded Howard. Uh, St Jay Stratton? St Jay Stratton had been a chancellor. Ah. Do you remember that? No. Well, I... That's what Paul told me, and if uh -huh. Paul tells me that's got it, he's got an iron memory. Any event, the idea was to put another person in there, and I didn't think about it at the time, but it also teed up a possibility for 10 years hence. Right. And Paul was generally perceived as rather more conservative. But they were very, very close, good friends. And I would say luck over skill, but I don't remember any, when we pulled that rabbit out of the hat, I don't remember anybody grousing about it. And I, I also, though, remember people coming up and saying, where in the hell did you get that idea? And, and, <laughs> And I said, well, we've got differences of views around here. This at least takes them into account, but it doesn't court on Jerry. Yeah. And nobody from the outside can say that we put a klutz in there to watch what he was doing. It's Did just, it take much to sell it to Jerry? I mean, no. some who picked up the phone no, and Fisk said... No, Fisk asked me to go with him to talk to Jerry. And uh, Jerry, I have to tell you... Uh, I can't remember, but later in life, after he was out of the presidency, I, I invited him to all the uh, committee meetings that produced Chuck Vest. I think I mentioned it to you, or maybe it was Catherine. I started in the, in the committees that I was the Boy Scout troop leader, invited the faculty to all our meetings. We never had a meeting without the faculty. And in the, in the vest outing, the faculty never... You went to talk to Jerry. I went with Jim. He was the you boss. You went with Jim, okay. Jim was doing what Jim did all his life. He was, he was tutoring me. <laughs> and he was skillful. So the two Wonderful. of you, after you made the decision... We didn't make it alone. We went and had a committee meeting and got the faculty in and told them, and nobody yelled or screamed or anything else. And I look around the room and so uh, yeah, <laughs> I, <laughs> it took your eye off of this ball and put it over on this ball. And right. this ball was very easy to look at. And these are good friends. They've been working together. Right. He just appointed them as dean. You didn't have to prove anything or make right. any assumptions. But when we went to see Jerry, uh, uh, Jim said to Jerry, you, this suggestion of you 
letting us nominate you, and that's the way I always looked at it. You nominated somebody to the board. Uh, it was contingent on you just giving us your word. You don't have to sign anything or anything. But you, as president, got to stop some of this because it's different. Right. It was borderline with being provost, but as president, you've got to cut it out. And a footnote to that is a year and a half after he was president, Fisk got me aside one day and he said, you know, you must have noticed he hadn't said anything for <laughs> a year and a half. And I said, yes, I had. Antiseptic. He said, well, you didn't have to be that antiseptic. So what do we do? We take him out to dinner again. <laughs> Tell him we don't mind if you say something now and then. Just be careful. <laughs> and Fisk with his big smile. Yeah, you know, he was a genius at dealing with brilliant, difficult people. And uh, before he died at one point, uh, Jerry said something to me one time, and I never quite got it straight. And he said, I think I know how I got past what I was not sure I could get past. And boy, if you don't think that didn't send me home feeling good, you're <laughs> wrong. And it, 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 just, it just took enough off of it. And he didn't have any problem with Paul coming along as chancellor. Not at all. And wasn't worried about how it looked. No, but or... he later on, you know, he realized he this guy was whatever his very IQ sweet. is is very high, and, and he didn't need any diagrams. Christ, he got it right away. <laughs> and it didn't bother him. It didn't bother him at all. And Paul I, if we'd was have, if we'd yeah. have tried to say this is your provost, I yeah. I, I think he would have balked. And and Paul was. Game. I mean, or, oh, yeah. or did you have to convince him? <laughs> he was more junior. I think he was told. <laughs> <laughs> but so. nobody was going to tell Jerry. And and the faculty were an advisory committee at that point, or were they part of the fisc? Faculty, the chairman of the faculty, for each each presidential search committee, and the one for Dave Saxon, would appoint a faculty advisory committee. Uh huh. And the, the 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 gray and the vest searches that I chaired, I would always at the begin, first meeting we had organizational meeting. He said we're going to invite you to every single meeting the corporation committee has, and we're going to be partners. But if you read the bylaws and the whatever, this is. A duty assigned to the corporation, and if push comes to shove, we decide. Right. And I don't want to water that down one bit. Now, having said that, we're partners, and I also, I think I mentioned this to you. You know, every once in a while, particularly the younger faculty, and the first, then the Wiesner adding the two young faculty were John Deutsch and Sam Bodman, <laughs> <laughs> and you know they had to be told to shut up every now and then. <laughs> And did Fisk, with his charm and chairman of the Bell Labs and so forth, could do that, but a grubby New York banker. So I decided, and Sheila Woodenall was the chairman in the Gray Outing, and Bob Solo was the chairman in, of the faculty group. In the, and I said, I don't want to be lecturing any of the faculty. Oh, well, I'm going to talk to them. But if, if one of them gets a little, and particularly the young ones, you get... You know, they got hung on, for instance, in the Vest case. He was a good scholar, but not a great scholar. Well, we aren't hiring him to be a scholar. Yeah. I'll tell you a story about th that subject on another occasion. But anyhow, it all behaved. Jerry knew exactly what we'd done. Yeah. And he, it got him past what might have been a herbal. Paul has told me, well, I don't want to say it, I don't want to record it, but it's, um, it, it's, you know, the more had done his deed. Yeah. It just took the steam out of that argument. So come to the, the next search. I mean, uh, well, the you know, next search. So, I so think Jerry was, served for about seven or eight years, I think. Uh, 
I would have thought he it was. He came in in 71, and in 78, you led the committee to, you began the committee that, that picked his successor. Leia's health. Right. They would come to Nantucket every once in a while. They had a home on the Martha's vineyard. Martha's vineyard. Yeah. We would see it, but um, it, it was always a shock to me to see how burdened she was. And they were a devoted couple, which was heartwarming to see. But he just said she can't. So <clears throat> we had a small committee. I think it was Patty Wade and uh, Angus McDonald and me. But the whole thing got cooked in a. <laughs> this was to find a chairman now, because Jerry chairman, wasn't Jerry going to be. Could not follow the then frequent pattern right. <coughs> of retiring as president and becoming chairman. Johnson right. had done it, Killian had done it, etc. Right. <clears throat> and uh, I lost my place briefly. So there were three of you. Uh, there were three of us, but the th thought I we used to have hiatuses at the. Executive committee, and go to the bathroom, get a drink of water or something. And I always sitting down at the end of the table. And on this occasion, Constantine was sitting at the end of the table by then. Constantine Simonides. Yeah, Constantine Simonides was, as he was secretary of the corporation. Right. And boy, he was a piece <laughs> of machinery too. <laughs> <laughs> and we got discussing. Uh, one of our fellow corporation members, David Saxon. Right. Classmate of mine, whom right. I knew reasonably well, but not terribly well. He was not like Joe Gavin, but he, I knew David. Fine man. And you had known him as a student, literally. Oh, yeah. Even, I mean, I also knew you don't that he met Shirley at a freshman mixer. <laughs> she was in. I don't His know. wife. Yeah. Yeah. But he met her at a mixer, I think. That's my memory of it. In any event, <clears throat> Constantine and I, he was a member of the corporation. And he was then president of the University of California system. And if you don't remember it, even then, we've got two grandsons in the University of California now. And it's 200,000 students now. But even then, it was 130 or 40,000 students. Yeah. But in addition to that, it was Los Alamos Laboratories, the Livermore Laboratories. There are two other great national laboratories. Right. You have to deal with the legislature, the governor, ay, 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 ay. And uh, <clears throat> Constantine and I thought that, you know, that's an obvious one. He's renewed his ties here. He's well-liked and gentle and modest bright as hell. And he had stepped down or was stepping down as from no, the presidency? No, or, no, no. <laughs> He was still? President. Oh. So I thought about it for a while. What the hell do you do when you call somebody like that? So I, I just started to have a slightly smart aleck conversation with him. And I called him up and I said, David, this is either going to be an absolutely ridiculous conversation that probably shouldn't occur, or it may be one of the better things that I've been able to do. I said, uh, some of us think it might be a good idea for you and Shirley to come home to Cambridge where you started and become chairman of MIT. <laughs> I'm quiet. And how, why, how or did you, what makes you think that? I said, David, if I'd been president of that place for 10 years, my memory is he said 11, but maybe if I'd been president of that place for eight years and he said nine, but he said one more than I was saying, and that gave me hope. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'd be tired. Long silence. <clears throat> he said, Carl, how the heck could I bring Shirley back there without starting all the gossip mongers out here in California going? I said, that's simple, David. You just bring her back to the next corporation meeting. We 
and we'll get whoever to write you a special invitation or write Shirley a special invitation for some reason and blah, blah, blah. Oh, Carl, this is a terrible shocker. Something. <laughs> well, I said, well, think about it. <laughs> and uh, I'll call you back in a week. I'll call you. In a week, he called me up and said, well, Shirley's coming with me on whatever the next date was. That's how we got David Jackson. <laughs> I, we had one or two other names, but that was a bird's nest on a the A chairman ground. search is a different animal from oh, a president's yeah, search. Yeah. But you want somebody of standing, somebody of knowledge, somebody of obvious interest. Right. And all that, as Constantine and I discussed, for this man was right on the table. And he right. also had a lovely wife who could help him in the social aspects of their more sociability connected with that and right. getting people up to that penthouse that they occupied for several years. And I think it worked out pretty well. Besides the search for the chairman, the new chairman Saxon, you then had to also replace Jerry Wiesner and you led the search committee uh, for that presidential search. Um, Which that produced came up Paul with, Gray in the end. So what, what that was, stage was MIT at and what were you looking well, for then or was he things, obvious? Things, yeah. things had calmed down quite a bit. Uh, and uh, it really turned out to an interesting problem, which had a surprising solution, again, which I'd like to mention. Uh, Paul was an obvious candidate. That was one of the concomitants and why those on the faculty of a more conservative view were tamped down in their ardor uh, because it was perfectly obvious that Ten years hence, or whatever it was, yeah. it turned out to be seven, I guess. Seven, yeah, because of illness, uh, <clears throat> Leah's illness. In any event, he was an obvious possibility right off. There was also, happily, another wonderful possibility, Frank Press. And Frank Press, at that time, I believe, was president of the National Academy of Science. And he had been a member of the faculty at MIT. I think he was a geophysical person. And he was a, uh, he was particularly well known to Jim Fisk. And every once in a while, over the years, Jim has head of Bell Labs, he would undertake for the United States government negotiations on scientific matters as the advocate or the lawyer, so to speak, you know. Mm sense for the United States. And often he would take one or two scientific types along with it. And his two favorites were Frank Press and the guy who became president of Caltech. Uh, David Baltimore? No. David did before become. That. But before Somewhat before that. And Fisk always said it was wonderful. I could intimidate the Russians very easily <laughs> by threatening to sink Fra Frank Press, and I can't think of the other guy's name, on the, on the debate, whatever the subject was, and the Russians would just absolutely turn green. These, <laughs> these guys were, Frank is a very, very bright man. And anyhow, those were the choices. And, <clears throat> you know, it took a few months to get to that, and we talked to other people and blah, 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 but you finally get down to wrestling. How do you choose between this? And <clears throat> I sort of stumbled onto something that I didn't really realize how well it would work. But Bob Sharpie, who had been a, he had been a member of the corporation at some point and was president of Cabot Corporation at that time, knew both Gray, who had been on the Cabot board when Killian retired. They asked me to dig up another MIT body, and I brought my friend Paul over there, and he was a director. I mean, the whole thing is incestuous. And um, 
so Sharpie knew Paul as a member of the Cabot Board, and he knew Frank Press. They both had something to do with the Atomic Energy Commission at one point, so he knew them both well. So I invited Sharpie to come up and talk to him. Now Sharpie is a very, very bright fellow, very, very sharp, but he has one Achilles heel. He often cuffs things, and I had learned that watching him at Cabot for a while. So I gave him Hail Columbia before he even showed up. That, you know, do your homework, Sharpie. You, you got problems with this old crowd. And, uh, you know, if you don't want to do that, I don't want you to come. But if you agree to come, I would like you to discuss your view of Frank Press and Paul Gray. And you can say whatever you want. You can say who you would prefer, you can not do what you want. But I don't want you to come if you don't have composed yourself. Now, when Sharpie composed himself, you could set type as he spoke. I mean, the, the verbs and the adverbs and the adjectives and the sentences and the paragraphs, I mean, you could just <laughs> And that's the performance he put on that day. We had, uh, I used to have off meetings in the banks conference room in New York. Nobody would expect anybody was looking for an MIT president in a New York bank conference room. So we were all meeting in there. And, and you know, with the two committees, it was a fair number of us, you know. It was our group and all the faculty, and they'd show up there. And They all came down to New York. Oh, uh, yeah. And, of course, it was handy for me. I just came from the 17th floor to the 6th floor or something in any of them. Sharpie perform. In the end, it was the most bravura performance I've ever seen anywhere. He talked for 15 minutes, not any more than that. He didn't have a note. It's like listening to Obama the other night, you know, and how does he get it all straight? He didn't have a prompter. He just, all up in the head, and he thought about everything, including words. And when he got finished with his speech, this was comparing pros and cons, Frank Press versus Paul Gray. And I've told this to Paul in recent years. It was absolutely clear to everybody in the room, and we later compared notes, <laughs> that he preferred Paul. But he had not said so. But it was clear. So when he got finished speaking, I used to go around the room and just take people in six, where they were seated, so you knew when you were coming up, so you had some get ready time. But the first guy was one of the young faculty. The young faculty or something in those committees, they have a, an alternating feeling of sitting quietly and saying nothing or shooting off, and nothing in between. Anyhow, this, this fella was very bright, very nice. But his first question to Sharpie was, who would make the better presidential science advisor? <laughs> and Sharpie, without hesitating, said Frank Press. Just like that, like he'd expected the question. He was just sitting there waiting for you to ask it so he could say, Frank Press. That stunned everybody in the room because they all, like me, had clearly concluded that his vote, if he had one, would be for Paul. And he let everybody hang on it. <laughs> Seemed like 10 minutes, but it was probably 45 seconds. And then he asked the next question. He said, now ask me, this Sharpie talk, now ask me who make the better Secretary of Defense. <laughs> that was the end of the search. He never answered it. Everybody got it. There was not a single dissenting. Some days later, when it was pretty clear we were about made up our mind, and I actually passed out little buck slips. I, I did not do that at the vest search. We, at the end, we were so together. But I passed out buck slips to the 
to the trustees and they, I got back every buck slip said Paul's name. First, not a single dissent. But Sharpie did that. I, I, I never, it was electric. And if you talk to anybody that was there when that happened, including Bob Solo, a fairly sophisticated guy, yeah. it stunned him too. And it also sharpened his view. And he's a smart guy. And why was everybody, it sounds like Sharpie knew that both of them well and was cogent in um, describing their strengths and, and weaknesses, but it's interesting that everybody was willing to take his say-so as their guidance in a way. Well, you didn't have to take his say-so. You knew his, him. I mean, you, well, you, if you knew say Frank him. Press. Frank Press is a brilliant scientist. He, he's one of the, he was one of the scientists. Mm -hmm. He was one of the brilliant ones around these days, and you know, and it's like Dave Baltimore. I mean, you didn't, you didn't have to deal with him very long, or or Phil Sharp, mm -hmm. to know that he was very bright. I never understood why he didn't get a Nobel Prize, but fact is, people knew that. But that's what, what that wasn't what we were trying to fill. Uh -huh. That's the point Sharpie made. Gotcha. And, and do you remember what what the case for Paul essentially was? Yeah, you know, managing a big, complicated situation. Uh -huh. uh, I, in my old age, have come to the conclusion that the ultimate skill for any human being is managing other human beings. And that is the most difficult of all. I have a, even, I got another story for that. When Fisk was head of the Bell Labs for 17 years, they had a, a we of 17 years. In my view, they made one of the greatest inventions, probably the greatest inventions of all times. Solid state physics, chips, transistors, etc. And three guys got Nobel Prizes in the Bell Labs for that. One of which, the lead fellow, Shockley, uh, quit the Bell Labs shortly after that. And he was a certifiable nut. He went around, to, he'd done a lot of work in, in genealogy and he had concluded that black people were inferior, genealogically speaking. And every place he'd go to speak would have a riot. And I said to Fisk one day after we were at an executive committee meeting, and he and I used to stay together in the Ritz Carlton, which my children called Daddy's boarding house. <laughs> <laughs> I, at breakfast that morning, I said to Jim, What in the hell happened to that guy Shockley after he left the Bell Labs? And Fisk leans over to the table, never spoke loud. Carl, what makes you think he changed? <laughs> The reason that guy got the Nobel Prize are two reasons. One, God gave him more gray matter or better gray matter. But the other, God gave him Jim Fisk to keep him from jumping off the cliff or blowing up the house or something yeah. else. Yeah. And that is to me. And Paul excels at that same thing. He. Uh, and the 80s, when, when Paul was president, turned out to be a tough period for, for higher education. Uh, I mean, it was well, but budget. You, you, yeah, but you got to, yeah, that's managing. Yeah, yeah. We, we had a little of that with Vest. Vest's academic career really got cut relatively short when he became assistant dean of engineering at Michigan. I mean, right. after all, he's in the overhead department now. And he kept getting up and up and up until he got into the ultimate overhead department. Right. <laughs> right. And and and, uh, but that really it it sharpened the point that we weren't looking for the brightest scientist in the world. It would have been nice if he. I often think if Sharp had accepted, we'd had a brilliant scientist who would have gotten a Nobel Prize while he was president, and all that would have been great. Yeah. PR, but he also had some managerial skills. Phil Sharp does, right. and but Paul has them in spades. Right. 
And incidentally, we don't make a big point of it, but I'm sure Kathy will tell you, Jerry left some, <laughs> a few messy things that had to be cleaned up. He hadn't financed the, the uh, media center all the way. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he liked the ideas. Yeah. And, and he had a cleanup crew to, well, the first few years of Paul's regime, I, you don't have to, I, maybe this shouldn't go in. Well, but the executive committee, even during, say, the end of Jerry's years, couldn't say, this is a great idea, but we need to find a way to, to pay for it. I mean, there, there's... Yeah. Well, you've got a, a guy that sings like a canary and is smarter than everybody else in the room. It's not so easy. Uh -huh. And also, you're damn lucky to have that perspicacity. So you don't I mean, want to he, stop the singing. He made this shift from electronics to nuclear biology or molecular biology uh, almost without shifting gears. Right. And uh, the Whitehead Institute, a guy. Yeah. You know, Whitehead had some absolutely fruity ideas when he came to see us, and we were one of the first places he came to see, and he and Jerry talked for a long time, and Jerry just decided he couldn't swallow all that stuff, and he said no. And if you want to back off from some of those points, come see me again. And Whitehead damn near made <laughs> deals else places. But he finally came back in the end, rather chastened, and Jerry made a good deal with him. Mm -hmm. And then, it's never been mm -hmm. said, but Glenn Straley largely rescued him because he he endowed the place with Revlon preferred stock. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, turning that into cash took some other alchemy. <laughs> but it's that kind of stuff. That was not Jerry's mm -hmm. forte. And Paul never... Never, Paul never complained about that. He just rolled up his sleeve and worked at it, and he fixed it. But in terms of an institution's leadership, how how much do you look for an alternating line of succession? In other words, a big idea person, a manager, a big idea person, a manager. In other words, was it maybe no accident that, that when you got ready and led yet another presidential campaign that that initially you were focused on Phil Sharp, who in fact was... Uh, he was a member of the committee, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he began to impress me and others, and uh, Bob Solo, who I was privileged to have as a partner. And I were having breakfast one day, and uh, before the meeting, and I ask, have you given any thought to this fellow Sharp? <laughs> he said, I sure have. I know what you're going to ask me. And I said, well, I ask you. He said, I think we should talk to him. So the next meeting, before the meeting, he and I went over to see him and asked Phil if he wouldn't like to resign from the faculty advisory <laughs> committee <laughs> put his hat in the ring, and he thought about it for a week and did. And we ultimately thought he would be a wonderful president. Yeah. I, I don't think you can have a, a type in front of you, but it, and it changes from time to time, too, what's important. I mean, what you'd mm -hmm. hire today, somebody's got to have some pretty fair understanding of the limits of capital and budgeting and mm -hmm. laying people off yeah. and you know you got a cast iron stomach right. uh, and it changes it changes right. but between press a very specific individual right Frank I would guess is a pretty good administrator but I'm not sure I when I checked up on the National Academy. He didn't. He wasn't interested in that. He'd rather talk physics with uh -huh. somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and and I guess people aren't monolithic either. Paul that was such right. a strong manager, and yet he had ideas like Europe, which oh, yeah. turned out to be this fabulous. Uh, uh, obviously, Paul's thing. a gifted man. Yeah. 
<laughs> I always remember somebody said, well, but he doesn't know anything about finances. And I said, just wait six months. <laughs> <laughs> so when it came time for yet another search, the, the one following Paul, and they said to you, don't you want to lead another search committee? Did, did you have any second thoughts? Did you say, hey, I've done my gig? Or uh, did you say, of course? Or Well, I had an office up at MIT when that happened. Uh, we were, I was nominally connected with the leadership of the fundraising campaign that we had at that point. And um, <clears throat> so I was sitting up there a couple days a week with Gavin and when he retired, David, three members of the class of 41. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I thought an awful lot about it. By that time, of course, I was comfortable. <clears throat> you know, when you do that for the first time on your own, even if you got some high-powered partners like Fisk as mm -hmm. my mentor, it's, it's a fairly daunting subject. And uh, things can get screwed up as they did in the case of Sharp. I remember he agreed to be president. Bob and uh, Solo and I took him and Anne, I think is his wife's name, to dinner at, <clears throat> at my boarding house, the dining room in the Ritz Carlton, water a dozen roses. And I went back to New York to deal with one of my personal problems, a kidney stone, to have a damn thing removed. Hello. And uh, Hello. it hurt. <laughs> and my pal Walter called me. He said, I can hardly tell you this. But Sharp just called me and said <clears throat> he regretfully had concluded that he should not go forward with this. So that's how you found out about it. Yep, I didn't feel the kidney stone for a half an hour. <laughs> I did ask the executive committee to discuss whether they wanted to replace me. There were a few in the corporation that got critical, and um, they did not. And we went back to work. From square one, or I don't recall. No, what, no, no, no. You had. I, I thought I mentioned maybe I didn't. Early in the vest search, <clears throat> I invited a fellow named Jim Duderstadt, who then was president of the University of Michigan, and had a, a wide, ranging group of admirers, as a university president. Yeah. And he was well known to a lot of people around. MIT and Harvard right. and friends and everything else, but he was a, he, he had quite a reputation. So I called him up. <clears throat> I said, you're going to require that I not, before I say anything, I'm going to ask you to come see us. And he said, what? <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm going to promise that we're not going to try to hire you. I have a very simple, basic urge for my partners and me to see what first class looks like. We'd like to calibrate our thinking. That got him. So he came to see us. And we spent, a wonderful man. And what I heard is that conversation was filed in drawer 16 <laughs> behind Phil Sharp. When he became Dean of Engineering at Michigan, a young mechanical engineering professor was made uh, associate dean or assistant dean or something. And when Duderstadt was made provost, this guy was made dean. And when Duderstadt became president, this guy was made provost. Now, you know, even a dumb steam thermodynamicist can <laughs> tell what Mr. Duderstadt thinks of this fellow that he just pulled along behind him. And so I never talked to Duderstadt about Vest. But when we had to start again, that's the first place we went. Interesting. 
and uh, I, I think I mentioned to you, or I mentioned to Catherine, I had a trouble, tough time getting him to talk to us because he had only been provost two years, and he felt great obligation to this man who had taken him along. And I said, yeah, but we're talking about being president. I hear you. <laughs> and then he said, well, I'm going to be in Ithaca on business, and I have to come back through New York, and let me see what the plane schedules are. He said, could you meet me in, could we talk in New York? You and two or three others would come down and talk to me in New York. I said, sure. And when he called me back, he said, yeah, he could, he figures he could spend an hour and a half with us if I could get a room in one of those little hotels, out, in which I had suggested, one of those grubby little hotels out across the street from LaGuardia. And so he agreed to come. And, you know, a good example of the kind of people I was working with, the whole damn committee, faculty and trustees, <laughs> were sitting out in that little grubby hotel when, when Chuck Fest walked into the room. Now, I don't care how sophisticated or stuffy or anything else you are. A couple, Nobel Prize winner, a couple of name industrialists, great faculty, great university, all sitting in this room just to talk to you. I mean, you. <laughs> <clears throat> and he made a whiz bang impression on us. But I, I think maybe I told it to Catherine before, but when I was taking him back to catch that plane, I miscued and I got into the taxi marshalling area. Uh, there was no way out. He was going to miss that plane. So I made an MIT decision up over the curb, <laughs> across the, not just a divider, it was a big whole place. I looked over, and here's this candidate bouncing around and down the <laughs> curve, and I finally delivered him to whatever the little. The MIT way solved the problem, right? <laughs> and I went to bed feeling terrible. And then I finally began to console myself that I had done one thing beyond question, and I've told him this a couple times. It always tickles him. I said I had proven beyond a shadow of doubt that he had the backbone to be president. <laughs> <laughs> he was. <laughs> I, he had a wonderful. He does have a wonderful sense of humor and modesty. Yeah. And he can be tough as Billy Budd, the Supreme Court decision. He reminded my old senior partner, who never used four-letter words, never raised his voice, but when he said, well, I don't really think we'll do that, that meant that the hinges of hell could swing before we would do that. <laughs> and Chuck, Chuck's declination is always gracious, but... After you've been tuned in for a while, you understand the door just went <laughs> shut. Let me ask you one more question about the Phil Sharp search. Um, Monday morning, looking back, had there been signals of ambivalence before? Well, he, he was suddenly... surprised when we asked him. Right. Paul always kids me and himself by saying he went to some academic gathering. You may have heard this after we had appointed Sharp, before he had turned us down. And Paul got a certain amount of criticism for picking that guy to be president. What the hell's the matter with you guys? He's got a God-given brain. What do you want to put him in that job for and take him out of that job? Talk to Paul sometime. He never got over it. <laughs> That's fine, yeah. Uh, but I, in the end, and Thank as you. I told you, after he had been elected president at the meeting, there was a news conference over in 10250. And you knew what the first question was going to be. Absolutely knew it. And we all wondered how he was going to handle it. And this was Chuck Vest. George. That's Chuck yeah. Vest, newly minted president of MIT, 10250, bunch of faculty and a few 
members of the corporation, but of course, uh, you can guess the, the <laughs> usual suspects were, and a bunch of reporter types. First question, Mr. Professor Vess, how does it feel to be the second choice? <laughs> this guy stands up, big smile on his face, completely unruffled. If you're referring to Philip Sharp, Professor Sharp, please know that I would be proud to be the head of any great university that had the likes of Professor Sharp amongst its senior faculty. Whole place burst out in <laughs> laughing. That was the end of the whole subject. <laughs> and Saxon poked me in the back. He said, We got a winner. <laughs> His innate sense of gracefulness, of course, that's yeah. what absolutely made his reputation in Washington. I mean, he had no side, or, and he may not have been the world's greatest researcher, but he had a first-class mind. And when he made the decision about defending that ridiculous... Antitrust overlap case. Yeah, it's stupid. But we had a famous, corporately famous to me, corporation meeting sometime later. I guess it was near the end of his tenure as president. He said that of all the things that he'd had to decide, that had been the one that he was proudest of and proudest of the Institute's support of that point of view and et cetera. And then he sat down and one of our great trustees, which I will not mention, really wonderfully, enormously supporting of the school, got up and said, had, had we ever given much thought to what it had cost and whether it was really worth all that? <laughs> and that just set me off like a mousetrap. Were you sitting there that day? I... <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help it. I had no control over what I was saying. I just got up and said that one of the reasons I had so appreciated being connected with MIT is that we didn't fail in a classical definition of failure. All that needs happen for evil to prevail in this world is that men of goodwill and capacity fail to do their duty. And when the Justice Department of the United States comes after us on antitrust grounds, where we spend twice as much on each student as we get paid, even if he pays all his tuition, mm -hmm. there isn't any profits that we're maximizing. We don't make any profits. Mm -hmm. But we are defending our principles. And these are principles we have followed out in broad daylight with other great universities for many years. And I am proud to be connected with that. Man, Jesus. <laughs> and this guy, you know him, stood up and he said he would like to change his qu question to a motion thanking the president for the courage of his decision. <laughs> <laughs> but I get choked up. This is MIT. Yeah. One of my dear friends in life, Bob McDonald, was a member of the management committee at Sullivan Cromwell, a big law firm in New York, trustee of Cornell University. And for years, the sort of off-the-record legal advisor of Cornell University. And he advised them to settle it right away. It otherwise, it would cost them a couple million dollars. Yeah. I used to give McDonald hell for that. And when I told him about this, he said, we made a mistake. Yeah. And you do in this life. Every now and then, you got to separate the men from the boys and the black sheep from the white sheep. And it's a sad day when people of competence and capacity don't do their duty. This place does. This special place, as Paul likes to call it. <laughs> I get choked up. Yeah. 
Chuck had not been a student nor a faculty member at MIT. Was that an issue at all? I mean, that he... One or two of the young faculty, it's always the young faculty, not the old faculty, complained about his scholarship as being good but not uh -huh. great. And do, do we want to have a president yeah. who wasn't a great scholar? <laughs> I got the guy aside, I said, go read up on James Ryan Killian sometime. <laughs> he doesn't even have a doctorate. Right. And he's right. got to be, by any measure, one of the great presidents right. of MIT. What the hell are you looking for? <laughs> to switch directions a minute, uh, the, the searches were some of the uh, highlights, I guess, of, of your long tenure. Um, so were some of the real estate dealings, which I think got uh, less uh, attention. Um, but I, th I think there were some interesting things that went on in your time. But you want to talk a little about uh, You know how Cambridge to ask the straight questions. Questions. One other great MIT man that I was associated with for years was Glenn Straley. In fact, when, who was the, our treasurer before Glenn? Uh, Snyder. Lovely. What? Snyder? Yeah. Snyder. When, when Snyder retired, Hard got me aside and said, you and I are going to pick a new financial guy. And we, I being in New York, there were going to be some, a lot of them down there, and I talked to a lot of them. And, uh, and he and I sat down one day, and Colonial Management, who had been running our affairs when I first went on that committee, uh, was often represented by Paul, by uh, Glenn, Glenn Straley. And this was 14 karat material. And who's the fellow that gave us the swimming pool? He and his wife. And she, Zessiger. Zessiger, Barry. Al Zessiger. Al Zessiger. I talked to him quite a bit, and that would have been a Rube Goldberg. He did not want to give up completely. He could be half-time treasurer, and we mm -hmm. futzed around with that for a while. But then Howard and I came to on Glenn, and that was that. And then... Who had been a student at MIT. Oh, yeah, yeah. a graduate, yeah. a good student and a very successful investment manager. But Glenn has great qualities. First class mind, but he handles people. And uh, I uh, formed a partnership with him. I was on that committee for 22 or three years. I was chairman most of the time. Of the investment committee. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this was Howard's doing again. When we picked Glenn, he said, now you're the chairman. And, uh, <laughs> uh, anyhow, it wasn't a big thing for me. I was in the business and I was getting... But Glenn Straley was an extraordinary man for me in my life and for MIT. Uh, <clears throat> he and I used to smoke opium. <laughs> and, uh, we did a lot of things together. You never hear about them. And some of them. We were sitting around with Jerry one time at an intermission, <laughs> executive committee, and we have something called, or we had Dan Pool C. Everything changes. But Pool C was the working capital pool. And if somebody gave you X million dollars to build a new building, <clears throat> it would have been the policy of the Institute for years to put it into Pool C and invest it in high-grade commercial paper, 30-day commercial paper. So you'd have the money whenever they started building or whatever building it was. And then we had other things. Uh, the military or the government from time to time would find it expedient to pay us ahead of time on something they knew they were going to owe us for Lincoln Lab or something else. So Pool C. And then inflation. So Pool C every year got bigger. 
And Glenn and Jerry and I were sitting around smoking opium. <laughs> and uh, we suddenly said, you know, this is like a barrel full of water. We keep putting it in on the top, and we take it out on the top, and we never disturb the water that's at the bottom of the barrel. Why the hell are we putting that water at the bottom of the barrel in 30-day General Electric super low interest rate commercial paper? We're in a bull market. Why don't we put some of that in equities or something else? Mm -hmm. But Christ, if this thing's getting bigger every year, why are we doing that? Yeah. You, know, you don't have to go to Harvard Business School to figure that out. <laughs> and anyhow, we thought about that for a while and we started out doing that. We started putting some of that into equities or something else. And Glenn kept track of the differential between the average on the rest and what we got off the bottom of the barrel. And my recollection is when that differential passed 200 million, he just quit keeping track of it. Now in those days, that was a huge amount of money. And it was found money. Right. Now we were benefited, back to luck, by one of the longest bull markets in history. <laughs> But we also went through the 1987 bust, I think, because we hedged ourselves. Yeah. And Glenn had, you know, I could say, well, Glenn, go get a hold of a giant good friend and tell him that we need to know how to hedge this silly thing we're doing. Uh, Glenn did that perfection. Mm -hmm. And we went through the 87 bus like it didn't exist. Uh -huh. But we made a lot of money on that. Uh -huh. I have the same feeling I think I mentioned to you, maybe it was Catherine. Every year the Lincoln Lab people would come in, you know, they're the radar people. They've been developing more and more elegant radar. I remember one time being absolutely awed when I saw a radar picture of a missile taken at 5,000 miles. 5,000, maybe it was only 2,000. They could do all sorts of things out there. But in testing these increasingly high-powered <clears throat> technologies and devices, they had to have a, a lot of space on the ground so they didn't radiate people. <laughs> and they got a place called Haystack out near Groton, Massachusetts. And every time they'd come into the executive committee to buy, buy up some more land, which they could do under the Air Force contract, <clears throat> the government would, would uh, pay us interest on it. And, you know, we just, it's like government bonds, and we'd pile up some more land. And there was an option in the contract that said, when, if radar, when radar becomes obsolete and we want to fold up the Lincoln Lab, <clears throat> we, the government, have the option to buy that land back. But Glenn and I never quite swallowed that hole. <laughs> he talked a few other people into the notion. So when the once a year came around and the troops would come in from Lincoln Lab, they would always wind up by saying, well, we're going to put another oomph, oomph kilowatt, something or other, big radar out there. And we got to expand the periphery of our land. Well, Glenn and I had been out to take a look at this land, and this land is something. If you've ever been up in Tuxedo Park, north of New York, this is what it looks like. It's hilly, slightly rocky, wooded. It's beautiful, and there's nothing on it. Nothing. <laughs> and that's why they put the big radars out there in the first place. But Glenn or Howard and I would always, or somebody else would say, well, if you need 50 more, why don't you get 75 and then we'll feel better. But we weren't we're thinking about radar. Now I'm out of date and all this could have changed, but about six or eight years ago, the Congress got on the back of the Defense Department if you own too much land in the United States, you know, God Almighty, the shipyards, air bases, you name it, Atomic Energy Commission, we want you to get rid of most of that. 
and all these contracts where you have options to buy more land, get it out of the contract. So that clause was removed at the request of the Defense Department. That they could buy back all this land from MIT if they wanted. They no longer have the option. And the, the last time I looked at it was with uh, who succeeded? Alan Buffett. Buffett, right. It was 11 or 1,200 acres. It is the most beautiful land. Uh, an acre of land in Weston is over a million dollars, maybe two million by now. I'm sure not going to be around when anything happens out there. Yeah. But. But, but that, you were party to the purchase of some other land that MIT well, that, 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 that uh, has been yeah, well, a bit more active. Well, I can't remember which came first or second. You know, all that junk land that used to be on the west side of Mass Avenue. The Simplex property? Yeah, Simplex. Yeah. And, I, and some of it was just, you know, there. I don't know what all, it was a terrible place. It was a mess, and yeah. there were pushers over there, and there were body houses, and I, you know, it was awful. What in the hell are you doing? That? And God isn't making any more land. And Glenn's view is, why don't we get that? So we start talking that to the executive committee, and at first it was like, I don't know. That's an interesting idea. Come back again, little boy, but get out of here. Who said that? I don't know. We got turned Somebody. down a couple of times. Yeah. But it slightly wore them down. <laughs> and how are you going to do it? And well, you thought about that. And we said we're going to get Norman Leventhal and a friend of mine by the name of Sam Walker, who is a New York City version of Norman Leventhal, enormously successful in the real estate business, and Sam Walker's a trustee of Columbia University, and he looks after their real estate, and they have a lot in New York City, including everything under Rockefeller Center at that time. And uh, he's a trustee of the Equitable Life Insurance Company. And he's a good friend, and he's a do-gooder. So we laid out a, how do you buy this junk land? And, of course, that's where Norman and Sam came in first. You know, you never knew. The same guy didn't go after two pieces ever. He was usually some schlocky guy that Norman had put us on to. Who <laughs> <laughs> came from a second-class real estate firm somewhere that no one would connect to MIT. And we got all the way down to, I think it was a small Cadillac dealership of all the places to put it was over there. He did smell it a little bit, and we had to pay up a little bit for it, but mainly we got it all for junk. Was there a notion that you would buy a certain number of acres or just anything that came up? or? Um... I, you know, I can't really remember. I think we just started to see what we could do. And mm -hmm. If we didn't get it all, that was right. But we got as much as we wanted. I think it was about 26 acres in the end. And <clears throat> then the question of who you get to develop this, and there Norman had here. He was better fixed there than Sam was. And he put us in touch with some people from Cleveland who actually ultimately did the work. And then the really big decision we made was the development. We were, the notion was to put no pound, no smell, no smell research, R&D, out there. And uh, early on, the folks from Cleveland said, you ought to put a small hotel out there because these research people, they're going to have to want to. So we got a little hotel out there. And, uh, but. The base, the $64 decision we made, and then we had quite an argument over it at the executive committee. We were not going to sell any of that land as it was developed. It was all going to be on leasehold improvements. <laughs> you know, God isn't making any land 75 or 80 years will go by before you know it. <laughs> and we get all this back. And you got a good example here. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Hunter Memorial Drive apartment houses were built on a leasehold. And when the first round ended, MIT took ownership of the apartment houses on the land. And then, God damn it, they sold it. <laughs> I could have killed them. That was after I was gone. But in my old age, I learned you never sell land. You get it and keep it. Mm -hmm. And what happens when that lease expires, you get the improvements on the land Free and clear. No, they're 70 or 60 or 70. We made it as short as we thought we could get away with getting it. The only real, the biggest problem we had though was handled by that genius Walter Milne dealing with the Cambridge Fathers. They are just about impossible. And they had all sorts of grandiose ideas of affordable housing for all kinds of people over there. We point out to them, yeah, and they're going to have all kinds of kids and they're going to have to have a school and everything else. We're just giving you income so that you can pay for everything else you got. <laughs> and Walter finally sold that, but we had to build, as I remember, a few apartments somewhere just for whatever reason, I don't know. But that has been a huge success. Right. And it's only another 25 years. <laughs> and we own it again. Right. All of it, with the buildings. And MIT's using quite a bit of it already. It's well, there's a lot of it, most of it is in outside ownership. Uh -huh. There's a, even a hotel over there. There's right. quite a few laboratories. Right. And the other part of the dream we had, which the whole executive committee accepted, was that it engendered it, it, it engendered contact between people at came in to do research there, and the institute. Mm -hmm. So the guy would wind up subsidizing some research at the institute or picking up part of the R&D yeah. budget or supplying some professor with wherewithal to do this, that. It, it, it's, it's got something for everybody. But my guess is that we are making as much out of that land today just off the rent as we paid for it. Yeah. Probably had a very unusual vantage point, even as a trustee, because you played so many different roles. You had so many different hats. You were on the investment committee. You knew about the budget. You were on the executive committee. You knew about all the, the key decisions. You had done the searches, so you had a special bond with the president. And so you had a, an overview that few people had, I think. Um, <laughs> None of it was planned. No, but <laughs> it but just happened. The result was. Uh, I had a good time. <laughs> it, it's sometimes said that that Harvard up the road shapes leaders, and that MIT turns out staffers, all these scientists who are, and yet here you are, you know, sort of the epitome of, of leadership. You you led an investment banking house. You you were at the top of a, a commercial bank. You you played this. Roll it oh, I, 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 Do you feel I, like MIT I, gave you the tools? Oh, that it, sure. Yeah. MIT gives you two things. Above all, you learn how to think, and you learn how to work like hell. <laughs> and everybody thinks that MIT men are very conceited about their brains. I've really not met very many that have any of that at all. What they're conceited about, horribly conceited about, they think they can work harder than anybody else. And you know, most of the times they can. They're unbelievable. Mm -hmm. When I went to work for Loeb Rhodes, they got more Rhodes Scholars and Summas and, you know, real, how are you gonna live over there? I'm gonna work harder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I got to be managing partner. Right. You work hard. So here you were working hard in New York at, at your career, and you were working hard. How many hours of a day, a week, a month do you think you were putting into MIT? Yes. Was it a full-time uh, job? No, no, no. Well, first place, a lot of it is telephone. I really, in retirement, doing nothing. I'm so occupied doing nothing, <laughs> I wonder how I ever earned a living. 
uh, it takes so much time with all these futzy little things that come down. I don't have a big... It's astonishing what you can stuff in. And it, the other thing about it, it's extraordinary how every once in a while they connect up. I had a wonderful senior partner, John Loeb. All you got to do is go up to Harvard University and ride around up there in the Loeb Theater and the Loeb this and the Loeb that. The Jewish sense of charitable works is extraordinary. And when he heard that I might wind up on the corporation, I said, I didn't know that that was going to happen, but it sure looked that way. And it'll take some time. And he let me know in his quiet way, he would be quite angry if I turned it down. <laughs> and, uh, he said, what am I going to tell you when you tell me I'm spending too much time in Cambridge? I'm not going to tell you that, Carl. We'll figure out how to do it. And as I walked out of the room, he said, there's one other thing. You can't do it for the reason I'm about to mention, but it's there. He said, it's good business. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, time after time, that would help. Standard Oil California bought Gulf Oil. And there were several big underwriting issues. And we were not in the magic bulge bracket of the, you know, this stuff. And so I called George Keller. <laughs> he was chairman. He seen me busting my britches for MIT. I said, I'm not going to call them until we've done something. And they, so we got on the phone to two or three of the congressmen that were going to have to vote on the SoCal purchase of Gulf that mm -hmm. would be financed by this issue. So I called George and told him what we had done. We'd been after these guys and had some response. And then I told George what I would like to ask. He said, that's all right. I said, well, do you have to tell the finance, uh, your financial vice president? He said, no, I don't, Carl. I'll tell him at lunch, but it'll be done. <laughs> and we got a bulge bracket. Wow. A three-minute phone call, yeah. probably worth half a million dollars. And he had been on the corporation with yeah. you for... But I, he, you know, I was doing the Lord's work, and he appreciated that. Right. I... Uh, and, and some of it is not that spectacular, but sometimes it's just finding out some information. But there is a business aspect to it. And, uh, you know, John and his wife supported all sorts of things. They built a library up at Vassar where... John Loeb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I became a trustee of Mount Sinai. I just... The Jewish people in New York support that place like you can't believe. And uh, I was proud to be associated with it. And my grandson went to medical school there. And in 125 students, he was third or fourth. And I could tell all my good Jewish friends, <laughs> that's what happens when you hire a, when you admit a smart goy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, it, I, John's support was very important to me. Right. So that's one side. You, you have a favorite picture in your apartment here with, with you and uh, several MIT presidents and uh, Walter Milne, and, and you said that that picture sort of gives you certain feelings. I don't know if it'll show now, but they can take it later if it doesn't, right? Well, it's a happy thought I had. <clears throat> uh, not long after we uh, installed Chuck Vest. Put it down here. Yeah. You know, I'm sorry if it sounds egocentric, but, but there's a certain satisfaction of having had, having had the privilege. If you add up up there, those three fellows were president for about 34 or five years of MIT's corporate life. And I had a hand in picking them. <laughs> and I feel good about that because they did well. 
You know, we had other great presidents. And maybe one of these exceeded the other. I don't know. They're different. So it's apples and bananas. But in their time, they pushed things along. And I think it would be say, fair to say that they left it a little better than they found it each time. And Walter was a dedicated man. He found MIT. He didn't go, I don't think he was an MIT. In fact, I'm sure he was not an MIT student. He went to Harvard Business School, though. But he came to work at MIT, and he was also the administrative person connected with the Howard Johnson search, which preceded Wiesner. So he was involved with four presidents. And, uh, you know, you got to have tickets to everywhere and phone calls and circulate information and get lists of that and so forth. Unbelievable. And also, it was he, <laughs> when we were doing this, real estate on the other side of town. We had to deal with the Cambridge father. At first we sent a, a, a fancy Boston lawyer over to talk to him. Uh, I forgot, I don't know whether I went over there one day and watched this guy and I <laughs> got back and I said, get that guy the hell out of there. And <laughs> we sent water. And it took him two years, but he did it. He did it. He's modest, he's very bright, he could applesauce them, he could give them hell, he could, whatever, whatever was required, he delivered it. <laughs> and everybody at MIT knew that. He was, um, he was a dedicated man. I mean, his dedication was MIT. He, not long after this picture, exhibited his first signs of Alzheimer's. And I used to call him up every once in a while. Hope it isn't too personal. I bought him a pair of gold cufflinks when we signed off on Chuck. But I'd call him up every once in a while. And, you know, it was very distressing. And Paul called me one day and said, Carl, it's time you call him again. I'm not sure how long he's going to be here. It's down to days. So I hung up with Paul and I called and got his wife and she said, well, not today, Carl. He's very low. But try tomorrow. So I called tomorrow. He was absolutely lucid. And we talked for about an hour. I told him I loved him. He told me he loved me. And later that day he died. But it, MIT really became a family for you. I mean, it, oh, yeah. it's been a significant uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> part of your life. Uh, Absolutely. You Paul can, Gray. Right? Yeah. You're one of the finest men that you can possibly imagine. It's a privilege. played a special role. I mean, you played a special role for well, it. Well, yeah, you know, role. that's it's very satisfying, and I won't admit that. If you Did you read any of that outrageous language in the honorary lecture? <laughs> I, I like that. Of course I do. But it's people that I knew. My friend Joe. My friend Bill, who's gone. But he and Joe and I are going to roll up and down the Charles together <laughs> for the first million years. Of it. I, it's you're lucky if that enters your life, mm -hmm. and they're nice people too. They're nice people. 